Okay, well welcome back, and this is the last lot of the question and answer session, so forgive me having broken it up over the last couple of weeks. We're in December, the moustache is gone, I kind of grew quite fond of it actually towards the end. But anyway, we'll crack on into it. So a question that I dropped from the last one, which is from Joshy P. When you're hunting Samba, what do you harvest from the animal? So from Samba, uh, I mean, even when I'm stag hunting, which is often I'm after a mature stag, but if we are going to take a meat animal, then I'll always go a younger animal, um, primarily for the meat. And what I'll take from any animal is, is always the tenderloins, which is the inside fillets from inside the sort of gut cavity. Uh, remove the guts and you can get access to them. They're sort of on the inside of the spine above the top end of the rib cage there. Take the back straps or the back stakes, which are those long stakes that start sort of from behind the neck and go all the way down towards the rump. And on a samba stag, they can be very big. Um, I tried ribeye steaks for the first time after watching Rob Fickling from Beyond the Divide from Maroka 30, having cut out a section of the backs, um, back section of the of the animal with the ribeyes attached to the ribs. And I thought that was great, so Andy and I tried that. Um, I'll always take offal. I think offal's actually a great cut. And offal doesn't need this sort of hanging time to set the meat as what usual meat would take. So from the offal I'll take heart, cut it up thinly, fry it fast, kidney, liver again. Um, uh, also, so for Samba, there's nothing wrong with, with the back legs, the front quarters as well. If you want to do some stews, if you want to do a roast, um, if you want to make sausages or salamis, I mean the front shoulder, usually with meat, and it's not just samba, but for any meat for instance, I'll turn the front shoulder into casseroles or stews, uh, or else mince it or salami it. I mentioned this in the other Q&As, but take seasoning with you when you go into the hills and bank on getting a meat animal or getting meat off an animal, whether it's a meat animal or it's a stag that you decide to utilize the meat, bank on taking meat out and eating it at camp to supplement your backpack hunt. Uh, it, adds, it adds a dimension that prepared food just doesn't have. I mean, you've earned it, you talk about it while you're eating it. There's just a lot of homage that you're paying to the animal while you're consuming it at camp after you know a couple of days up to a week on the hill. So. I think the key with venison is you just want to cook it hot and fast. And I like to have it reasonably rare. Okay, so thank you for that question, Joshy P. All right, so I've got a question from Luke Duncan. G'day, Jamie. I was wondering how come you stopped running your website? I think I have read every single article of your website and they make for bloody good reading. <laughs> Cheers, Luke. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Luke. Um... I stopped, I haven't stopped the website, well, no, you're right, I stopped contributing to the website, the website's still running, just to clarify, that's the, the mountainman.co.nz website, I set that website up back in 2003, um, just a funny story actually about the website before I answer your question, Luke, my mum gave that website to me, my mum's a computer design type person, um, and she put the website together for my 21st birthday and gifted it to me and said, Jamie, you know, you seem to spend all your time in the mountains. Um, I've got this website domain, Mountain Man, and I'd like to give it to you for your 21st birthday. And so she gifted this website to me. It was in its earlier form. And she just said, you know, you've always loved sharing your experiences with others. And it's a platform that allows for people from anywhere in the world and all walks of life to read up on it uh, and see photos and get information. And, and, you know, I had a great mentor being Stan Lowe who helped me out immensely. And I think I've always had that desire to want to help others too. I don't, I don't shy away from helping others. If people ask questions, I'm happy to give them some information. Um, I won't give them all the secrets, but... I enjoy it. I get a lot of satisfaction in seeing others do well on perhaps some tips that you've given them. I mean, they've got to put it into practice. They've still got to do all the hard work. So she gave me this website and I just used to contribute a lot to it when I had more time. 
The reason why I haven't been as active on it is the last six years anyway, the kids arrived and just life got thrown out of whack a little bit. That really slowed the hunting down and it just didn't give me time to be able to even fulfill my own passion, which is to hunt, let alone capture that and put that onto uh, magazines or onto the website or onto forums. I used to be quite active in forums too. So that all, yeah, it did it sort of waned and now that the kids are getting to the age where they're a little bit more manageable I think I'm a few years away from getting getting my life fully on track but this year 2018 my goal this year was to actually just structure a YouTube website I just thought you know what I want to do something different I want to do I want to do it through film because film allows you to express yourself in a, in a very authentic way that you can't hide behind words, you can't hide behind a photo, it's, it is what it is. And so I thought, well, I want to do this. I've been inspired and motivated by other people that are doing film. And that was this year's goal. 2018 was just sort of setting up a YouTube channel to just continue to contribute to. And in behind the scenes, my brother-in-law, Gerwin, who I thank gratefully because... When mum gave me the website, I ran it for a few years and then Gearwin came along and he was studying at uh, Christchurch at the time, doing graphic design and sort of computer-based sciences. Very clever guy, Gearwin. And he took on a project through a sort of assignment where he helped basically totally overhaul my website. And he's done that a couple of times. He's now doing it again. And 2019, you'll see a reinvigoration of the the mountainman.co.nz website and I, I want to try and tie in and make it interactive so that there's not just photos and articles but there's the videos I want to embed the videos I want to create categories and themes that allow a greater uh, user-friendly experience for people on different devices whether it's phones tablets computers TVs so yeah watch this space 2019 will be just a, a project coming back to the mountain man website and putting some some tender love and attention into that because you're right i have left it out uh for the last i reckon good seven to eight years so i do apologize for that i hope the content that's on there from many years ago is still being used i can still see it gets a lot of visits so it's still a, a highly trafficked website and like when I think about it, that, that website being set up in 2003 was probably one of the first recreational websites of its time where I wasn't trying to monetize or sell advertising. I've never been about trying to make money from, well at, at first I never went into it trying to make money out of hunting. I've just done it because I love it and I love to share it. And it's still the same. I'm still not selling anything through it. People ask me, why don't you set up shops? Why don't you try and sell content and brands and get affiliated? I mean, really, other than just being a Stony Creek team member for a period of time between 2006 through to 2011, I think, roughly, 2010, 2011, I haven't been in any way making money from this passion. So... Uh, I don't think you'll see that happen anytime soon either, but I am going to come back and reinvigorate the website. So watch that space. Thanks for that question, Luke. Okay, now I've been purposefully leaving this question to last because it's such a complex question that deserves a comprehensive answer. And it's from Zane Cameron, good old mate Zane Cameron from Topri or Taupri. <laughs> Um, Narawa here. G'day Jamie. I'd like to know what environmental damage tar can actually cause. Is there a species of plant that tar can eat that is actually endangered, such as the mountain daisy? And are tar actually a threat that you have to take out so many? Or is this a myth that green-led political parties are using as an excuse to cull or eradicate our prized game animal? Also, can you tell the hunting community who or what political party in New Zealand are wanting to eradicate tar, as there must be a higher party than just Doc that gives Doc the go-ahead to do these culls? I think this information is important to the hunting community 
to know so that we can work into the future to change or vote these people out. Zane Cameron. All right, so firstly, look, Zane, I do, I do believe, like any introduced gay man in New Zealand, there needs to be a balance met, um, a balance whereby the animal can live in our uh, lands without being eradicated. I mean, and I'm talking about game animals like deer, tar, chamois, um, pigs, goats, all of those animals I think have a place in our heritage and culture now and I, I would not want to see them eradicated for so many reasons other than just hunting. Even if I just purely went into um, photography or conservation just walking into the bush I still actually enjoy and prefer there to be those game animals in, in New Zealand because they offer so much I mean food recreation the very lure the adventure all of those things that have been talked about through this Q&A series um, so I do think that there needs to be a balance I do think that there can be too many animals uh, and we've seen it with deer in the from the 50s through to the through the 70s with deer culling from helicopters and that, that came about because the deer numbers were so high that there were bounties put on them and people could make money from culling them and to some extent we're seeing that now with the wild animal recovery operations too when the venison prices get high enough and I think you know those peaks and troughs while I'd prefer to see it managed so that it's, there's not so much a spike and a lull and a spike and a lull like these big peaks and troughs I'd, I'd like to see it maintained at a, at a more managed and stable level. And sorry, when I talk about pragmatic management principles, I guess a, a fundamental example is that if you're wanting to control the population, the way to do that is to remove nannies, females, ones that are going to breed. You can have one bull that can service 10 nannies. Let's say there's 10 nannies there, and that can create another set of offspring, if you were just to assume that they were only going to have one extra kid the following year that that group of 11 could now be 21. So if you remove six or seven of those nannies then essentially the following year assuming that that bull was to mate with those three other nannies you might only be looking at a population of seven instead of 21. So if you want to control a population you don't do it through killing the bulls and let's face it most hunters, and I'm saying most because there are a few, a small minority, that do prefer to hunt for tar and take nannies out for the food element, and that's great. More, more of those people should be encouraged to do more of that, right? But most people are driven by that prized, beautiful bull that's got this enormous mane and these great hooks and the sheer size of a bull tar is sort of two and a half times a nanny so when you're looking at them on the hill it's hard not to be drawn to these big balls of muscle and fluff. We're there to try and pursue the ultimate alpine species, a big bull tar. I mean the terrain that they live in is something to marvel at and so for the government not to have seen the value in bull tar and not just for hunters, but I'm talking about for commercial operators too. Guides, people that have concessions to take people out. I know a few people personally, Joseph Peter, uh, Tom Jones, are a couple of people that spring to mind. They rely on that income on tar to take people out for tar, and they're targeting bull tar. And that's just one of thousands of New Zealand businesses that benefit from tar and I'm not just talking about the actual guides it's also the tourism industry with accommodation with booking of cars with supermarkets that stock shelves so that people can buy stuff with the hunting stores that are scattered throughout New Zealand that sell ammo or gear or whatever there's these cottage niche industries that benefit off of you know tar being in the hillside and for the government to fail to have seen that and not have thought about some of those pragmatic principles around population control with concentrating on females rather than bulls, I think just shows an idealistic flaw in, in that current government. And I'm so pleased that the New Zealand Tar Foundation and the Game Animal Council and hunters in general lobbied so strongly for the government to wake up from that stupor and listen 
And I, I hope that that's a lesson learned for future governments. But I think it's a wake-up call that hunters also still need to do their part in controlling numbers too. If you're in a catchment where you're seeing a high density of tar, then shoot a few nannies. If you've already shot your bull tar, do the catchment a favour and take out a few nannies as well. And I think that's an important lesson that we should all take from this whole saga. So, Sorry, so I guess coming back to your question around tar, I think the history of how we got to where we got to with the tar is political for certain and we had a national government that were essentially short of seats, uh, a Labour government formed a coalition with the Green Party and New Zealand First and I'm not, I'm not going to get political here, that wouldn't have been my vote, put it that way, but essentially the Minister for Environment wanted to go ahead and do this tar cull. They hadn't done any consultation with the relevant stakeholder groups, which is ironic because, you know, the Resource Management Act and so many of the, the founding principles of New Zealand policy, uh, even at a regional council level, it is all about consultation with key stakeholders. And key stakeholders were not consulted, and so when the announcement was made about this massive tar cull. It got hunters, it really united hunters, it brought hunters together from wide and far and people f chipped in. I mean, the, I think there's a lot to be said about the Dooley family and some of the key movers and shakers that were assisting the Dooleys in establishing what was the New Zealand Tar Foundation, I think. I mean, Willie Dooley and Greg Dooley basically bankrolled a an injunction, a legal injunction, or at least we're getting ready for a legal injunction on the government to ask them the hard questions. I mean, how could they go ahead with that particular cull without having gone through adequate stakeholder engagement and wanted to see the evidence of how they had made that decision internally within government so that they could find this cancerous problem because that, that shouldn't happen, right? And the hunter community chipped in within days. I mean, there was over $150,000 worth of donations made, which was fantastic. And look, I think that actually just shows the strength and resilience of hunters to, to want to hold the government accountable for um, decisions that oh, I think, whether they're unwarranted, they certainly weren't, they didn't go through the right processes with engaging with people and getting um, a mutual outcome, if you could call it that, because I think a mutual outcome is difficult to achieve, but certainly you need stakeholder engagement first and foremost before you can um, make management decisions that are going to obviously affect a lot of different user groups. And essentially what happened is the government uh, realised that they maybe had stepped over the line. We had the National Party that was, I think, doing, doing some good work and asking the hard questions on behalf of hunters and showing their support for the hunting community by asking the hard questions to Eugene Sage saying that they should stop the cull. And the, the Game Animal Council working um, very hard to, to get an opportunity to meet with TAR liaison group, essentially those groups wanting to get together with the minister and have a discussion on a, on a mutual outcome or a, or a pragmatic approach. And you saw the minister back down essentially and now I haven't actually been reading up on it as much but I think now uh, there's not the same plans to do what was originally proposed it's a much smaller version of that and I think now essentially you're going to have a voice within the hunter community getting across the views of hunters it's funny because it takes an event like that to unite what's essentially quite a fragmented and fractured group really. I mean hunters are quite fractured, we've all got our own very specific views on what's right and what's wrong um, and approaches to hunting, I mean meat hunters versus trophy hunters, you know, hunters that only go at certain times of the year, hunters that don't want to shoot hinds, hunters that only shoot stags, I mean the list goes on and at the end of the day put all of that aside we're all hunters. 
we just sometimes choose to look at it slightly differently and that's okay. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a different lens for how we choose to hunt uh, or where we choose to hunt. But at the end of the day, we're all hunters and we all wanted the same thing there, which was a pragmatic outcome that wasn't done without any adequate consultation. So in terms of Zane, what do they actually eat? I, I honestly would have to read up on papers to be able to tell you the specific species uh, that they eat, the different alpine herbs. You talk about the Mount Cook lily, and for those that want to get all scientific, that's the Ranunculus liali. Don't even know if I've pronounced that right. But that's a basically like a, a alpine buttercup, and it's characterized by having a beautiful white, flowery outer skirt to it with a with a yellow center in it and obviously they pop up during spring and summer um, up in the alpine zone and tar are known to eat those but they're also known to eat a much broader range of of flora as well which i can quickly talk through when i look at the rumen samples from some of these studies that are coming in from tar the bulk the bulk the majority of their food source is coming from grasses at 55% roughly of their intestinal um, food source and content is coming from grasses. In the herb range, which is where you've got the Mount Cook lilies and some of the other um, alpine herb species, they're accounting for 17% roughly. And then into the woody plant range, which is you know moving down into your alpine scrub belt and further down into your podocarps and I uh, don't know if they'd eat much beach but moving into your wooded timbers you're looking at a total woody plants of around 23% so of those three major clusters which makes up the total bulk of their food content the least consumed amount by tar is those alpine herbs it's more the grasses and then the woody plants rather than those alpine herbs. I'm not going to try and answer that question Zane on are they having an impact. I'll leave that up to the scientists to, to do that and I think what I would like to see come out of this whole saga, this mismanagement of tar, is that the money that was raised or future money that's raised gets put towards research that is scientifically robust and pragmatic and offers good recommendations so that governments and hunting groups can make informed decisions about how best to manage our wild game animals. And that doesn't just stop at tar. I'd like to see it for deer. I'd like to see it for whitetail, chamois. I'd like to see that at a much broader scale than just tar alone. And that's a good segue, actually, just jumping back. Luke Duncan, who was the second year Lincoln University student. I don't know what you're studying, Luke, but what a great opportunity for students to want to get into applying their science degrees in a way that can can maybe contribute towards better understanding our wild game animals in New Zealand uh, so that there can be better informed decisions made from that robust science. But in terms of researchers, David Forsyth is one that pops up a lot and I remember reading about that, any papers from David Forsyth from as early as the 1990s when he did his thesis I think on on tar um, and he he's done a lot of observations of tar in and around um, the eastern side of the main divides particularly the rangatara on how tar behave what they eat uh, their movements throughout different times of the day times of the season um, I mean there's other research that's now being done from a recreational hunting perspective, what the value of the pests are, whether they're pests or um, or resources. I mean, Ken Fraser, Graham Nugent uh, are playing in that space. There's Graham Hick Hickling, uh, John Parks, Ken Ken Huey. In fact, Ken Huey did um, was working at Lincoln University when I was there. There's a heap of different papers on tar. Anyway, I think everyone will agree that we don't want to see too many of anything and have plague proportions. So I don't see why there can't be a balance met between having a, a managed 
targeted culling program that coincides at certain times of the year in catchments in a way that's communicated well with different user groups so that there is just total transparency on what's happening so that hunters who are coming from near or far, international hunters or backpack hunters that are wanting to go onto public land can't see in advance where these different culls are going to occur so that they can plan around it and at least avoid those catchments either during the time that they're happening or shortly after the culls have happened and I would like to see greater accountability for hunters in wanting to take those and actively contribute towards removing females from from catchments so that they're contributing to that uh, population control and equally important ensuring that those culling operations are not targeting juvenile bulls or mature bulls so yeah Zane thanks for that question that was a tricky one I, I sort of jumped around a little bit on that one so I apologize but in short I think what you have is a result of having idealism in politics which doesn't have a place in my opinion. So yeah that brings this whole Q&A to an end. I'm, I'm really grateful for the questions. There were, some, there were some good ones in there that I had to sort of think on the hop. I apologise if I didn't come across as, as well prepared. I literally just took them for what they were and just decided to answer them. I didn't want to do too much preparation and, and feel like the answers were forced. Although on a couple of those tricky ones, I probably should have put some pen to paper and structured a more robust response, but it is what it is. And I thank you all for the time and effort. And I'm gonna to start to spend a little bit more time over Christmas and New Year's doing some fishing and putting together some slightly different content. So stay tuned.